Hello and welcome to the Think Liberty Podcast. I'm Vinny Marshall and on this episode we're going to be going on again about MMT a little. I know I've been going a little hard on that but this is going to be a good one. We have a special guest but before we get to that I do just want to take a minute to get this out of the way in the beginning. Think Liberty or rather, the, <laughs> the Think Liberty podcast is a part of the Think Liberty podcast network. Uh, you can find us on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, Overcast, any of those places that you normally go to find your podcasts at. Uh, as always, Think Liberty can be found on our website at think-liberty.com, on Facebook at facebook.com slash thinkliberty.tl, on Twitter at think underscore liberty. We're on Instagram at Think Liberty, one word, Steam it and Minds as think-liberty and YouTube. Uh, we're there as Think Liberty TV. Now, I think I got it all. Is that is that all of it, Caitlin? It is. Okay. Speaking of which, I am joined by Caitlin this evening. How are you doing, Caitlin? I'm good. How are you doing? I am doing fantastic. And thank you very much for asking. And now, to our guests. So, um, when you talk about MMT and you 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 know talk about all the ins and outs of it, a lot of people reference this episode that aired not long ago on Tom Woods, where uh, Bob Murphy debated an individual named Dylan Moore, and we have the pleasure of having Dylan on our show tonight. Dylan, how you doing? And thanks for joining us. I am doing excellent. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. So Dylan uh, is a, and please keep me honest, a supporter of modern monetary theory. Is that correct? I don't know if that's an accurate, logical way to say it. It's more, I'm an observer of MMT. I would say uh, whether or not you support MMT is kind of like saying whether or not you support F equals MA. Right. In, that, okay. in, the, in the sense of physics. Right. That's fair. That's fair. Well, And so this is good. I mean, I think we started on a perfect foot because, you know, myself included, I think a lot of times it's easy to kind of frame it that way. It's like an MMT supporter or like a proponent. Uh, and that's where these things get tangled up. And and I bring this up because I've seen now debates with Warren Mosler, who is um, kind of like a figurehead, right? Did he did he come up with this? I think so. I, I mean, in the way that it's described now, yes. Okay. Okay, that's fair. So you, you'll see if you go on YouTube, you know, you'll see Mosler in debates with, you know, ironically, the same guy you debated with, uh, Bob Murphy. And it's it almost seems like these shouldn't be debates. Uh, and I, if you could, and, and if you're kind of picking up on, on what I'm what I'm laying down here. So do you know what I'm talking about? As someone who espouses this or talks about it often, um, do you notice this kind of phenomenon where it's like you feel like you're put in a position to debate when really you're just kind of like, no, 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 guys, I'm just talking to you about my observation here. Yeah, that's exactly what's going on. OK, and it's, it's so. Now, because of that, so you, you did a, a nice little uh, intro on the last debate you were on. So you, I'm just going to keep in mind here that most of our listeners uh, are totally clueless on MMT. So with that said, do you want to kind of give us a little introduction on what the theory is just kind of in a nutshell? Can, can I give an introduction on my relationship to, let's say, libertarianism first? Please, please do. Absolutely. Because I I don't know if pe pe this will make someone listen more or not, but I, I feel like it would make me listen to somebody more. So I'm going to say it, which is my background when, when I first started getting into economics was Austrian economics. And I could consider myself an anarcho-capitalist. I think libertarianism doesn't even take it far enough. And I, I mean, if we're going to split that hair. And when I first bumped into MMT, I thought it was socialist claptrap. I, I, you know, it's like, oh, what is this? The government just prints money and that makes things better. Are you stupid? Go away. And <laughs> the, the person I actually bumped into, um, his, his name's Nima Majur. And uh, I, he's the guy I talk with when, when I talk MMT over on, on my channel. Uh, he had the patience with me because, because I, I just railroaded him with, you know, what about this? What about that? What about Zimbabwe? What about inflation? What about... And he had an answer to every single thing. And he was really patient with me. And he said, okay, go check this out. Go check this out. Go check this out. And I kept checking it out. And one day, um, it clicked for me. I, um, I, I had this one question answered. We could talk about what that is in a bit. And I was like, oh my God, I never thought about it that way. And so then I had to go back to Nima and say, okay, Tell me everything you said again. I'm listening this time. 
and what I realized is that particularly from kind of uh, I'll just say libertarianism is kind of this wide reaching general description. Sure. Um, the the libertarian mindset, generally speaking, toward economics kind of throws too many things at the wall at once that you can't really dissect them. And if you, if you slow down and look at these pieces individually, you see that they don't really match up with each other in terms of the libertarian story. And when I got the explanation from the MMT side, I, it was it was like, oh, my God, these actually all fit together. So I wanted to say that because I am, I'm not a progressive. I'm not a socialist. I'm not a Marxist. I'm, I'm not anyone coming from that side of the aisle. Mm-hmm. Um I understand what the death count of socialism is. I'm not saying that that's any great idea in any sense whatsoever. So with that being said, the the premise of MMT, I think boils down to, because I, I, I've been going around in my head what, what I think fundamentally is the basic premise. And I think the basic premise is whether or not money is a commodity or money is something else. And to, to put that in a, a historical sense, are the origins of money an advanced theory of uh, um, advanced theory, you know, an advanced um, method of barter? Or did it come from somewhere else, say, like the state? Now, the Austrian idea is that money originated as, as an advanced form of barter and then the state came along. I know, I know this is this is generalizing and making it a little too simple. And then the state came along and said, OK, give me give us your money so we can spend it on things for we want because we're the state. and We're going to tell you what to do. But when you look at the historical evidence. It seems to be the other way around is that tribes typically um, dealt with uh, with resources this way where the tribal leader would pretty much control everything. For, for example, if if we go to like the Iroquois or something, um, everybody would do work and bring it to. I, I don't know if they had longhouses. I, I might be confusing that with the Pacific Northwest, but the, the, you know the the common house. Everybody would bring it there, and if you needed something, you would have to refer to the elders or the chief and say, "Okay, I need a pair of shoes. Can I have one?" And then the chief would decide whether you get one or not. So it was it was, um, I guess, very socialistic, very centrally planned, where you know one tribal leader gets to control everything. Well, an advanced form of that is if the tribal leader starts demanding arbitrary tokens. So, so, um, I mean, in modern day, in the United States, we use dollars. Um, If I want to use Delaners, making a joke off my name, Dylan, (laughs) and I say, okay, um, Vinny and Caitlin, uh, next week you owe me 10 Delaners each. And you both scratch your heads and you go, "What, what the fuck's a Delaner? And I say, oh, well, if you work for me, I'll, I'll I'll pay you with it. And you're like, well, what if I don't pay you these ten dollars? I say, well, I'm going to throw you in jail and take your stuff. And I and I have the the military means to do so, which make make you two go, OK, well, I better work for these things because I don't want to go to jail and I don't want to lose all my property. So the historical evidence points more toward. This this state theory of money and that markets probably actually followed states rather than the other way around. Now, the implication of this is that the Austrians, because they really want a private currency, and I'll I'll say this right now, I'm not saying that a private currency can't exist. And um, I'd love to talk about that in a bit, but just for now, let's stick to how we got to where we are in history. What the, what, uh, the Austrian viewpoint seems to be to me, at least when I was an Austrian, is that, okay, if we st- if we take away the monopolistic control of money from the government, we will go back to the way that people used to do things, which is form their own currency through an advanced form of barter. However, if that was never actually the case, that isn't there to fall on. So if we want, again, to t- talk about private currencies, if we want to talk about what a private currency is, is or what it would look like i think now what we're here's here's my support and here's my opinion side of things this is not an observation i think 
that we would have to analyze modern money theory and the way that currencies work through states in order to design something in the private sphere. Any questions so far? Or should I keep going? Uh, keep going. No, keep going. I'm just mulling over all that. <laughs> okay. So now what are the implications of this? This this is starts to get really interesting. So if the if the state issues money, which are these arbitrary tokens or dollars or dollars or pounds or euros or rubles or whatever. <laughs> right. Um, and they're valued because I'm going to beat you up if you don't give them back to me. What that means is the only way that you guys can get them is if I issue them in the first place. So th this this is where the confusion about the national debt comes from, for example, is that um, because it's called debt, people naturally assume it's something that somebody owes. I, I mean, otherwise, why would you call it debt, right? However, because... And the, the national debt is created by the government spending. Now, when they spend, they're actually spending money into existence. And so... The, the debt, in quotes, that the government, and, and when I say government, I mean federal government, the debt that the federal government is in, in quotes, is actually the amount of money in circulation. And when the government taxes it back, because the government doesn't actually need the money, because, because it's, a, it's a logically inconsistent that an issuer of a currency would actually ever need it from anybody. Right. Like, right. If, if I have a magic pouch that I could infinitely pull money out of and let's say I give you $100 out of my magic pouch and I say you got to pay me back be, for whatever reason, my ability to continue pulling money out of that pouch has nothing to do whether or not you ever give me that money back. Um, although it does have to do with whether or not someone might accept the money in the future. Right. So. When this money gets spent into existence, it's not actually a debt. Nobody owes it. And the, the fact that it's called a debt, um, I think that uh, MMT should start uh, re re looking at its vocabulary and uh, coming up with some better words to describe these things, because it's not actually a debt. When um, the government, the federal government starts taxing more than it spends, so a.k.a. a federal government surplus, what they're doing is they're pulling more money out of circulation that they're putting back in. Now, um, th there's a, there's an element here that I haven't talked about yet, which is the private banking system. But um, I, I want to talk about it without it because it, it gets the, the concept across. Sure. Is that if we start pulling more money out than we're putting in, that's what causes financial crashes. Because the private sector needs a certain amount of money and uh, specifically needs a certain amount of net savings in order to feel comfortable spending. And if that net savings drops a, a, a below a certain amount, uh, the, the, the private sector gets really nervous that it starts, uh, in quotes, hoarding its money. Not hoarding in the sense of like, you know, socialists will break down your door and steal your shit because you're hoarding, hoarding, just saying, I, I don't feel like spending it because I don't know if I'm going to get more in the future because money's short. Right. Well, that's what causes everything to snap. And if you look at the historical record of the United States, every single economic crash, and there have been seven of them, six depressions and one recession, were preceded by a uh, uh, federal government surplus. Including 2008 and including 1929. And the MMT... Go ahead. I've been talking a lot. No, 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 no. This is this is good. This is good. I think it's important to explain this. I would assume most of our listeners aren't would benefit from this kind of thing. I was just so then what you're saying, just to kind of, you know, frame it for people listening is then the kind of austerity measures that people are used to uh, when it comes to balancing a budget it actually do more harm than good. Then is the implication of this theory. Well, well it is the harm. So right. the 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 Austrian uh, remedy for too much government spending, which 
is less of a problem as I'm, as I'm starting to describe than, than than what Austrians tend to think it is, or what you know even neoclassical economists tend to think it is. Um, the remedy for this is to say, okay, stop the government spending and get a surplus, so so we're not in debt so much. And um, it, it'll it'll be painful in the short run because you know people are going to go off welfare, and then there's not going to be so much easy money uh, from loans, uh, which is. The, the loans thing is completely incorrect, and we can talk about that later. Um, but, it, you know, in the end, things are going to settle out, and they'll stabilize, and uh, we, we won't have an entire class of people dependent on these government subsidies. But in reality, what you're doing is you're removing money from the monetary system. Now, whether or not I like that system, I'm not talking about right now. I don't like the system. But the fact that the system works that way is what I'm talking about. So the the remedy that Austrians, libertarians and, and even neoclassical guys or, or neoconservatives or neoliberals, all these people, um, what they recommend will cause the crash that they say they're trying to avoid. Right. OK. OK. So this is a lot. Caitlin, do you have any questions uh, to this point? Uh, that was a lot to take in. Um, <laughs> I've I, I haven't heard it explained <laughs> in that way in all together. Um, so, I guess my question would be: so when there's a surplus, prices would go down, correct? You know, the value of the dollar, you know, goes up because there's less of a supply. <laughs> Subscribing to MMT here, and that would. That, that would get more people off of these welfare programs that would decrease the need for government spending. It would decrease the amount of money that needs to go out because these people aren't subscribing to these programs anymore. What, I, I guess, what is your opinion on that is my question. So, um, first of all, I don't like welfare programs at all. Me neither. Yeah. That I, I yeah. And, and I mean, I, I want to be clear on this because, um, when, you know, the pro progressive MMT side is jumping up and down saying, hey, we can afford uh, free health care, we can afford free education, we can afford free this, free that. Uh, my response is just because you can afford it doesn't mean you should pay for it or or doesn't mean you should buy it. Like just because my I can afford to buy a car and pay for my son's insurance for the rest of time doesn't mean it's a good idea. Um, but I, I think more importantly, you're speaking about inflation. Am I right? Yes. Or, or deflation in, in the case that we're, we're talking here. Yeah, so yeah, uh, yeah. one of the things that MMT uh, talks about is that the supply of money is not the only thing which affects inflation. Okay. And uh, there, there can be quite a, a, a number of other factors going into inflation. And a, a better person to be on he here to talk about this one than me would be Nima. Um, I'd recommend grabbing him. He'd be happy to come on. But... Uh, Simply, for example, the uh, credit system can be a cause of inflation. For example, um, it is generally understood that when, let's say that there's, there's a certain uh, market out there for a certain service or a certain good, and, and somebody wants to come into business for that market, for that service or for that good, that they will look at the prices that that good is, is currently going for and build their business around those prices. The way it actually seems to work is more that the, the person puts their business together and then they say, okay, can I fund this? What credit speaking from a bank? Because the bank wants to make sure that they're getting paid back. So the, the profit in there, obviously you want to pay yourself, but the way that the bank is looking at it is they say, OK, we want to make sure that there's enough profit in here to make sure that, you know, if, if you have a bad week of business or a bad year of business or whatever, that you, it's not going to kill you and you're still going to be able to pay us back. And there's there's a bit of a pressure from the credit system to keep those to, to, to continue put pushing prices up. And, for example, if the money supply dwindles. And people suddenly can't afford my service. I can I can only drop the prices so much before I can't pay my loan back. And instead of the prices continuing to drop, I j uh, I just go out of business. Yeah. Um, for an example, that, that uh, as an example of another force on um prices, 
Another example would be um, labor, organized labor, which I'm not a fan of unions either, but they do exist. Um, yes. That does that does affect what things are going to cost. So do you want me to keep talking about inflation? Because it's kind of a deep one. Uh, yeah. That, yeah, no, I mean, okay. un unpack. Yeah, okay. unpack yourself so, here. I'd like because to hear uh, this is one of the things that Bob Murphy came back to me with. And he came back to Warren Mosler uh, on the, the same thing, which is there's this hidden tax called inflation, where if we print more money, yeah, maybe you, you move some resources around or gave some people some welfare or something. But in the end, you destroyed people's savings. And uh, that's the hidden tax. Well, the MMT response to that is, yes, money printing will create inflation if there are no um, underutilized resources. So, for example... Um, if the government spends money into existence and there's, there are people unemployed and by, by putting that money into existence, it employs people that more or less, I mean, like I said, there's other factors and not everything is as, as clean as I'm describing it, but more or less that won't inflate the economy because you've introduced goods and services at the same time that you're creating more money. Does that make sense? Yeah. It, it does. Uh, so a question I have uh -huh. there, if I, if I may, in that scenario, are you concerned with the artificial price floor that's caused by the creation of jobs from the, the public sector? Yeah. Because that to me, because when I, you know, when I, when I think of inflation and all of that, um, the, the thing I think of is, is the trigger point being that, right? Because then you're going to get into a situation where you know, to compensate these, the company will never eat the cost. Well, they can't. Right. So I think it's safe. It, it, they can, but I think it's safe to assume that like historically, it's just not a, a course well, of action. That's can I give you the taken. Warren Mosler answer? And I think it's a really good one. Sure. Which sure. is, and, and he uses the example of a restaurant, which is that uh, if you own a restaurant and, and you don't have a lot of people come in to buy food, you might have to start laying some people off because you just can't afford it. Now, right. if you start getting so busy that, you know, you're slammed every single night, whether or not minimum wage goes up doesn't affect you that much. You're, you're, you're not going to start laying mm. people off and you don't need to raise prices because you're slammed. So th th this is an example of the, uh, the, the productive capacity, which I was talking about which is let, let's say that restaurant um, can make a certain amount of food and let's for the sake of simplicity, it only serves one thing. Um, so, you know, every time somebody comes in, they order the same thing and, and you're going to make the same amount of money. Um, if more money gets spent into existence and more people can afford to go to the restaurant uh, and more people start going to that restaurant and, and, and it hits uh, productive capacity, um, even if your employees' wages rose forcefully, I mean, if I was a business owner and I suddenly got slammed, I'd be paying my employees more because I want them to stay around and be good. But that's a different story. Um, even though you you had you had to raise your wages, you're making so much more money on the uh, uh, on uh, the customers coming in. You don't care. Sure. So I guess the question then would be like, what if someone was 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 operating at maximum capacity prior? The egg, you hit you hit the nail right. on the head. If you're yeah. at maximum capacity, introducing money is inflation. Okay, sure. Be, because because essentially, th th this is what kind of blew my mind is that. So, we know as ANCAPs that uh, the government only has one tool, which is mm -hmm. violence. And printing of money, so. Um, and, and honestly, printing of money is, isn't is the, the right way to describe it. It's creating money and sticking it in somebody's bank account. That's what. Happens. Right. Right. Most of it's electric. But I think I think most people get the gist. If you say printing yeah, no, no, money, and, um, uh, what I mean to say is it's not like they print it and they throw it in the air and it kind of flutters around and, and kind of right. hits people or whatever. It specifically goes into specific bank accounts. They inject it uh, strategically. So and. and uh, and I'll even say I, uh, I I have my own business. I got a property cleanup business and uh, we did a job for HUD in um, February, which is awesome because once I found out it was HUD, I just jacked the price up 
because that's the way government contracts work, right? Because you know you can. Right? Because I know I can. And especially <laughs> now that I know MMT, I'm like, the federal government has infinite money. Give it right. all to me. Right. <laughs> give, me give me some more zeros at the end of Give that. me some more zeros on that sucker. Right. But, um, w- but what the government did by hiring me was they violently moved private resources to the public sector. So okay. whenever the government prints money, it's it's a it's a violent movement of resources from the private to the public sector. But it's disguised because the violence is on the other end through the taxation. Because taxes are demanded, we're all looking for this money because we got to pay our taxes. So when someone offers it, we'll go work for them. And so uh, the government, instead of having to uh, having to bust down our doors and steal our stuff, they can just offer us money that they create out of nothing. Sure. Okay. Okay. So. All right. So, uh, and, uh, uh, and then uh, here's what I wanted to do about, uh, say about unused capacity Please. where let's in our, let's go to a socialistic paradise and the government's giving everybody a job and Bernie Sanders is King and everyone's happy. Um, can you imagine Bernie Sanders with a crown and a scepter? I could, I could actually. That's pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've made a meme of that before. Yeah. In, in a throne in Vermont. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I can see it. I can totally see it. So at that point, if Bernie Sanders says, okay, I'm going to introduce some more money to hire some more people. Well, there's no one left to hire. And, and now the money just kind of floats around because uh, there, there's no more uh, resources to utilize. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So I I have some questions. Uh, The first question I have isn't, I want to make a distinction. I I feel like, and and, you know, I've fallen victim to this too. I, when people are kind of trying to wrap their heads around modern monetary theory, it's usually comes with, uh, is accompanied by, however you'd like to say it, the, the political preferences of the individual espousing it. So of course, so with someone who is much more familiar with MMT than I am, one question I, I would like to ask you then, so where are we going to draw that line, right? And for the sake of the listeners, for the sake of even me knowing, where I want to know where, where, is, where does the theory live in just the bubble? Like where, where's that intersection, right? Where's the line that's okay, here's the theory, and now that the theory's good, these are my, my, my preferences. So what, is the theory just the construct of... Okay, you got to think of it as the issuer. You got to think of debt differently. You got to think of a surplus differently. And you have to think of austerity measures differently when you're talking about government finance. And is that it? I'm is not it? entirely sure I understand your question. Okay, sure. Uh, all right. So I'm talking about the line getting blurred, obviously, right? About, about, and, and, understanding... and what's the line specifically understanding just, just the objective the formulae? Versus what I want to do with him. Correct. Absolutely correct. Um, I think that gets so tricky. Because. And I, I've been thinking about this too. Because I, I put, I, I'm, I'm still tripping. After I figured this stuff out. Because I'm like oh my god. What does this mean? Sure. Everything I, everything I knew is not what I thought it was. Fuck. Right. Right. <laughs> so. So it's like okay. Let, let, let's, let's do some logic. All the government can do is violence. That's its only tool. Printing money is violence because they have a monopoly over it and they they make it valuable through taxes. Because they have a monopoly over it, the only place for us to get money is by the government printing it. Therefore, the only way for have for us to have a monetary system is government violence. Oh, right. That's tough. That's oh, tough. As, as I didn't want to hear that. Cap, I didn't want to hear that. To reconcile. But well, okay, so how do, how do cryptocurrencies work out? I mean, I know they're tied b- b- to USD. Before we get to cryptocurrencies, sure. Um, there's we yeah, I really kind of jumped ahead. I'm just... Yeah, well, we really hit the bare bones of MMT, and um, we really didn't give a description that 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 like puts it in the real world. And uh, I wrote down a couple of points here, and tell me if you guys want to hit these points, which are um, government bonds, the private banking system, hyperinflation. Yep. And um, 
I'm guessing you guys wouldn't have asked this one, but uh, I'd bring it up anyway. Sectoral balances. I would not have asked, but uh, I, I'd be interested to hear what you've got down for sure. Okay, uh, you guys want to hear one or the other first? I'm really interested to hear the federal banking system part. The the private or the federal? The well, the private, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Quote, right. Unquote, yeah, oh yeah. Private. Yeah. 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 Quote. Total. Totally. <laughs> private, quote. Unquote. Totally private. Easy. Give me a fucking break. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's that's one thing we so, all agree on. Yeah. <laughs> um. The private banking system actually generates most of the money in use. Um. I I, I think it's roughly ninety percent or something like that. And uh, this is an excellent time to talk about the fractional reserve system, which doesn't exist. I'll tell you why. So. Oh <laughs> Ooh. This is my, this is my, by the way, this is my, this, my, my by far my favorite thing about MMT so far is just these profound yeah. like, yeah. bomb dropping. <laughs> just statements. like you thought you knew what was going on, smack. No. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Right. I'm going to challenge you. you. Okay. So <laughs> something like 90% of the, the money in the system is created by private banking. And uh, when we say private, we laugh. Um, really, Private banking is a quasi uh, private institution that has government license to create money. Do you, you guys follow and are okay with with that? No, yeah, that's sweet, sweet, the state sweet, sweet privilege. state privilege. So, um, when we get a loan, and uh, we, we all figured this out when we were watching all the sovereign citizen videos. Uh, when, when we get the loan, they, they make the loan out of nothing. Right. So you, you go in and you're like, okay, I want $200,000 to buy this house. The bank writes $200,000 on a piece of paper. They hand it to you. You hand it back to the bank. It becomes a deposit. And they circle jerk each other until the end of time. Um, sure. However, the difference between that money creation and the m money that's created by the government is that money's got to get paid back. So as as I start paying back that uh, loan at interest, amortized interest, and um, usually end up paying uh, two to three times more, depending on what the interest is, by the time you've paid a three-year loan back. I could talk about that, too, but that's a different thing. Um, there's a way to hack that, by the way. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, when I'm you pay that back, the principal <laughs> actually gets destroyed. So... Um, because the money's not a real thing. It's just a, a ledger. It's, it's just a accounting unit. When you pay back the principal, the principal gets destroyed and the bank gets to keep the interest as the profit. Now, what that means is 90% of the money, roughly speaking, in, in our system, as it gets paid back, it's going to get destroyed. So now I talked about really, really quick expand on, on destroyed. Um, doesn't exist annihilated okay okay the universe deletes it for sure, sure. <laughs> it just it just bounces uh, into a fire pit it just it bounces into a black hole fire pit whatever you want gotcha. to call it um so when i spoke about before federal government surpluses when when you know the government is is destroying more money that it's creating what's actually happening is because if you if you do the total math where if uh you owe me $200,000 and I'm owed $200,000. If we add those together, it equals zero. So what that means is the the sum of assets and liabilities of the private sector are zero. And because the government debt doesn't actually need to be paid back, the government doesn't need it for spending. That They need it to make the money valuable, so they got to take a little bit of it back, but they don't need it to, to afford stuff. The net private sector savings is the government debt because the private debt cancels itself out. So when the government starts pulling more money in, then it's pushing out. The private sector has to rely on itself more. And, and again, private sector has to in quotes, rely on itself because these are quasi private entities, these banks. Um, the private sector has to rely on itself more to get its funding, but because that funding actually has to get paid back. Um, this is the balloon. Is, is that it, it, it funds itself more and more and more and more and more. And eventually somebody can't get underwritten anymore. 
and then the whole thing snaps back and that's what causes a crash so no, nobody listening to this is going to like what I'm about to say now is the way to st- the way to avoid the government crashes is to increase the government spending or decrease or, de- or decrease taxes. Right. Or uh, that, uh, adjust the, the trade imbalance. Right, because the, the big, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, according to this, it sounds like, you know, uh, decreasing taxes then would decrease. Right. The, the dwindling of the supply from the public sector. Yeah, it, w- it would increase the deficit. Correct. And I'm a big proponent of decreasing the taxes. In fact, uh, Warren, uh, I interviewed Warren Mosler a while back on this. His uh, recommendation was to completely eliminate all federal taxes, except maybe. And, and this is just an idea he was just coming up with, you know, throw like a 5% property tax on everything and call it good. Right. Because according to this theory, right, taxation does hold value. Uh, outside of like deficit and surplus nonsense, as according to this theory, it holds value due to the the coercion, right? Yes, right. So you want it? It's it's it's, sh- it's shake down money from from the mafia. Right. You you need it because they're coming by and they're going to burn your business down if you don't pay it. It's to it. Them. It. Uh, you were talking about the. Um, I like that metaphor. I actually used it in the article that that I that I met you on was the uh, the the kind of the blanket of fear to feign confidence. Yes. Well, I don't think it's to feign confidence. It's real confidence. If I got a gun and I'm pointing it at you, I'm pretty confident. Well, I mean, I guess I right. Um, but this is kind of more in this position of um, the person getting the pun- the gun pointed at them, right? Like I, I don't necessarily think of confidence and fear as being the same things. Uh, I I see what you're saying. We're we're committing a fallacy of ambiguation. Sure, now. sure. Yep, I get it. Yep. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um. Uh, so, fractional reserve lending doesn't exist because bankers lend money first then they find reserves okay because fractional reserve lending says there's a limit to the amount that a banker can lend based on the amount of reserves that they have and whatever the government decides the reserve ratio is so it's like okay if we have a thousand dollars then and and the ratio is ten percent we can only lend out um nine thousand dollars actually it's the other way around it doesn't matter how much reserves the bank is sitting on it can loan out whatever it wants and let's say it loans out a hundred thousand dollars and the reserve rate is ten percent after they loan out a hundred thousand dollars at the end of the day or the end of the week or whatever the you know the period is that they got to match the books up they go and find reserves somewhere and the reserves are always available even at a last last ditch resort at the federal reserve every single bank in order to be a bank you have to have stock in the federal reserve right. and um you have to have a, a reserve, uh, not a reserve account. A, uh, it, uh, I forgot what they call it. It's essentially a line of credit. They call it something right. different. It's, this is the reason you put quotes around private. Yeah, because um, in order to create this money, you and I can't do this. Right. <laughs> right. Not, not, I, I mean, not right. not without following all, all the SEC regulations and right. crap. Um, and getting all the licenses and stuff. Then and then at that point we become a bank. And actually, Dodd Frank, uh had this in it where uh, are you guys familiar with owner financing real estate no not entirely no so essentially if if i own a house and let's say i don't have a, a loan on it and you guys want to buy it and i'll say you know what hey i'll be the bank you give me 20 percent, and, and let's go with this with a hundred thousand dollar house so you give me twenty thousand dollars i'll loan you eighty eighty thousand dollars on interest so we just set up a loan where you pay me eighty thousand dollars of five percent interest over 30 years or whatever sure. um Dodd Frank says, if you do three of those, you're a bank. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and you better follow SEC regulations. And of course, you get into the same bullshit where it's like, OK, I'll just open a new LLC for every one I do and I'll avoid the Dodd Frank regulations. Right. Well, that, yeah. Yeah. yeah the typical, you know, back and forth bullshit. Mm-hmm. OK. All right. And uh, oh, go ahead. I-, I wanted to say this on the fraction reserve thing. So if, if anyone doubts me on that. Keep in mind that Canada has a 0% reserve rate. So if fractional reserve banking was real, that would mean Canada would like instantaneously dive into hyperinflation because all the money would just like fly out of the ground <laughs> infinitely. Right, right. Jump out of its fire pit. But- Right. <laughs> what, where uh, in reality, what, what slows down the private banking system is uh, 
ready and willing borrowers. So if I come to the bank and I don't meet the credit standards and I don't meet the underwriting standards, I don't meet the legal standards to get the loan, I don't get the loan and the money doesn't get created. So no one's going to like this either. <laughs> um, part, part of the reason for crashes is when the private sector leans on itself too much and it's because there's poor regulation Ooh. for the private banks, in quotes, private lending money out. Because, for example, when we see in 2008, a huge issue uh, was these liar loans that people were able to get where you you could just, oh, yeah, my income is $100,000 a year. Give me a loan. And the bank was like, sure, here's three of them. Um, those people n never had the ability to pay that stuff back. Oh, you, right, right. And. But that's a regulation problem. Sure. Sure. Okay. I so man, lots of questions. The first question then what do you have a proposal or a recommendation to replace this uh the, this this fractional reserve system that you just explained? There is no fractional reserve system. Well, I mean <laughs> damn damn <laughs> MMT. <-er. laughs> <laughs> Done. <laughs> right. So so say you remove it. Remove what? Re remove this thing. These well, these practices, right? I mean, I get. I guess then the get, answer is get specific for me. Well, I I totally have faith in you to get specific for me. Well, no, I, you know this is stuff that I'm still I'm still trying to wrap my head around too, and I think it's why that, that question's so important. Um, when you kind of try to figure out, okay, where does it separate from? This is what MMT is, and this is what I I propose. Right. Well, and then for for me, I'm I'm still learning and I'm not entirely sure what I propose cuz I it, like I said I'm still tripping over what I've learned. But um I've I've got short-term ideas, medium-term ideas and long-term ideas. My short-term idea is don't balance the fucking budget and cause a crash. Sure. Right? It, it's like okay, while we're all figuring this out, don't do that. <laughs> I don't I don't care if you have to spend more. I don't care if you have to tax less, whatever. Just don't do that. Medium term, I think we, we could start talking about refining. OK, what what are the better things to violently move from the private sector to the public sector? And, um, you know, the, the ANCAP comes out and says, well, they're all immoral. I completely agree. But, um. You know, spending it all on welfare versus spending it all on infrastructure. I, I definitely prefer one over the other. If I, you know, if I had to choose um, long term. And when I say long term, I'm talking like we're all dead and our kids are dead and maybe their grandkids are mm -hmm. dead. Um, how do we how do we create a money system that doesn't require violence? Right. Okay, that's 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 fair. So, I right, you know before I give you another question, Caitlin, do you, do you have anything you'd like to ask? Actually, your last point: how do we create a money system that doesn't require violence? Um, I, I think a lot of them have already come into play. Like, I mean, you have Bitcoin that takes no violence whatsoever. Yeah, but I don't think Bitcoin's a money yet. Yet, I think it could be. Like, I I think it could be too, but I, I don't I don't it think it's money. yet already kind of kind of but it's it's so dangerous to use as a money because i mean you, you talk about you know the uh the, the u.s dollar is going to inflate or it's going to implode or something you want to have your savings get rocked like on a fucking roller coaster keep it in bitcoin oh yeah absolutely i mean <laughs> but i mean you did say it was a long term so in long term you know hopefully all the bugs will be worked out and bitcoin can be a stable currency i don't see having first well, well and and well so here's uh, I don't, <laughs> you sure you guys want to go into the private currency thing because I'm sure anybody listening to this is jumping up and down still about at least hyperinflation and um, <laughs> why, why does the government have to sell bonds I, I think uh, this is probably new territory for everybody but yeah. I, I so I'm I'm particularly interested in private currency because that's okay that's that's kind of what I see to be a solution to, to a lot of this stuff. Right. So, I mean, for me, like where, 
where MM, I think the difference I have with MMT is MMT kind of looks at it and it says, you know, here it is. So, so far, what I've heard from you, I think the biggest thing that I've taken away here is the implications of leaving the system. That's the one thing that I hadn't heard before. Um, that's that's striking mean? to me. Well, because the way that you, you, you kind of framed it, right, when you when you talk about, well, I think the state came first and then the market came after. And then you kind of really get to the core of the difference between the MMT group and the Austrian group is you've got the MMT group that's sitting there saying, now, don't be so sure that removing this apparatus is going to be in our best interest. And you have the Austrians that are like, absolutely, burn it down. (laughs) Right. Kill it now. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. And I think that's that right there is your polar difference. I think that's the big, because yeah. I was trying to find the difference. Oh, look, a lot of what is being described here, I, I don't entirely disagree with. There are some things uh, that I don't agree as much on, but like, I think a lot of the stuff that the MMT group and the Austrian group are saying are, are, are pretty similar, right? They're both going to tell you, look, there are no private organizations here. <laughs> everyone's playing, everyone's Correct. playing the same game. Uh, well, and then the, the, the fact that you're spending money is a government activity. That's what blew my mind. The the dollars in your hand and the dollars in your in your bank account is a is a government action. Right. And so so what this means is we so have no idea what a free market actually could look like. We haven't got the faintest, foggiest idea because the one thing that Ayn Rand herself championed as like the the ultimate symbol of free exchange is in itself a piece of government. Damn it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no shit, right? It's like, oh, my God, this pub is like 87 layers deeper than I thought it was. Fuck. No, it's, I mean, it, look, it's certainly deep, you know, even, even in that article, that was, I, that was one thing that I, I tried to express frequently and often is it, you know, there are so many moving pieces here when you're having this discussion that it's, it, the, the more you're aware of the moving pieces, I feel like the easier the discussion is to have. Uh, and that's, that's right. probably why people get underwater so quickly is they start talking. It's exactly what happens. Yeah, we start talking about some of this, these arms and apparatuses of these mechanisms involved, and it's like, oh boy. Well, and then a, a lot of them are totally unnecessary. Right, and so, Mo- so Mosler says this, and it's really interesting, um, uh, about the bonds. You would mentioned the bonds. Do you want to talk about the bonds a little bit? I don't know. Is Caitlin ready? Yes, I'm ready. <laughs> Lay it on me. <laughs> that, that 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 sounded hesitant. <laughs> I want your permission to go forward. Please, please go forward. <laughs> um, bonds don't fund anything either. Oh boy! Right, and so I now I I did watch your interview with with Mosler. I you know, but I I do want to talk about Mosler here a bit uh, in, in in a minute. But in my research, you know, trying to figure out MMT, I actually came across your video, which was. Uh, interesting that we had our conversation as, this morning for anyone listening. I, you know, just, just met him this morning and he did he, kind enough to decide to come on our podcast. We were both dicking around on Facebook more than we should. That's have. right. That's right. But it's okay. We have a good result here, but yeah, I, I did watch that. Um, <clears throat> and it was really good. And, uh, this, this bit about bonds is, uh, is very interesting. And someone brought up a good point then if bonds, if paying bonds back and I get Mosler in other videos, I've heard him talk about it as like a kind of a leftover habit from the gold standard that just never got dumped. It's essentially like a UBI for the upper class that can afford to like buy up a bunch yeah. of bonds and just have this kind of like passive income. You just get free money. Right. Right. Yeah. There's this no, uh, no risk money. Right. Because they're always, I mean, uh, the, the, historically the government always pays its debt. Correct. It's particularly when there's when it's not pegged to anything and they can just print it. Right. 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 So so yeah. So, unpack that a bit. Yeah. So essentially, I, and, and I'm going to talk about now and not the gold standard. We can talk about that. It, it, it'll, I think it'll make more sense if I do it backwards. Is um, essentially like we talked about before. It is logically inconsistent to say that the government needs anybody's financing or anybody's taxes 
in order to spend because it issues the currency. It, it doesn't make sense to say that it needs needs it back in order to spend more. It's got this you know infinite pouch that it can pull money out of. So when when people talk about like oh my god you know China's got all this debt and you know it could crash the economy if it calls a debt due it actually doesn't make any sense whatsoever. What a bond is is it's simply a government security. And what a reserve is, reserve being cash. Think about it that when you put cash in your bank account, it's a reserve. Right. Um, th to the banks. What a reserve is, it's a U.S. security. They're both U.S. securities, and the U.S. creates them both and destroys them both at will. And... All a bond is, is a security that pays a little more interest than the reserve. So here's how China ends up with all this, in quotes, debt, is because we have this massive trade deficit going to China, they're sending us piece of shit goods uh, covered in lead, and we send them money, U.S. dollars. Uh, the Chinese companies, because the uh, money there is the yuan, they exchange it for one so they could spend money at home and the government ends up with all these u.s dollars um which are kept track of at the federal reserve now they're sitting on all these u.s dollars and they go well we might as well earn some interest so they buy a bunch of bonds and when the bonds are paid out it's not like the government needs to sell more bonds or it needs to collect more taxes in order to exchange those bonds for reserves right. All they do is they go to the Federal Reserve and they say, OK, minus bonds plus reserves. OK, you got paid. That's it. It's 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 as simple as moving money from a checking account to a savings account or vice versa. Where the bonds are the savings account, which pays a little bit more interest and uh, the reserves are the checking account. And just like us, um, you got to move your reserve, your money from your savings account to your checking account before you can write a check. It's that simple. Sure. So then along that, that line of thinking, if you removed the practice of, of bonds and, and all that, and there, there'd be no, the only effect that would be felt is the individuals wealthy enough to purchase up a bunch of bonds to get that passive income we were talking about wouldn't have that passive income anymore. And that's essentially the entirety of the implications of removing bo the bond practice. Yeah. Well, and then it also depends on the interest rate. And that's another interesting thing. There's nothing natural about the interest rates. Um, interest rates, uh, the, the interbanking interest rates are always fall to whatever the Federal Reserve interest rate is set. At. And that just makes sense. Right? So what this no, means, no one's going to do it over it because they can just go to the Fed. Well, there's no one's going to do it. It's over it. And, and this is what blows my mind about the Austrian thinking is, is they keep talking about the government artificially pushing down interest rates. Interest rates are naturally go down to zero on the interbank lending market, and they artificially get pushed up when the government raises the interest rates. And when they raise the interest rates, what that means is they're paying more out on bonds. Now, um, the, the Austrian understanding is this means the government is panicking because they're offering people more money to come bring them their reserves. Um, What it's actually doing is it's just creating more money for people who already own bonds like you said and um when people because they think that when you lower the interest rate this actually inflates the money supply because it makes it easier for people to borrow money because the money's in quotes cheaper that's not true like we talked about before what limits the money supply is ready and willing borrowers um and for someone who wants to get into business they really don't care what the interest rate is they just want the money to make the thing work and then they'll adjust their price accordingly in order to pay sure. all the bills so to be fair um uh-huh i this 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 one is a little is a little much for me to wrap my head around it's the only reason i'm stopping you i have some i have some questions here so stop me as much so, as you want i to be fair, I think the Austrian position is any kind of manipulation is is artificial, right? Um, now the 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 so that that would that is to say, you know, if the government pushes it down, that's artificial. If the government pushes it up, that's artificial. And then now you, and then now Correct. you will come back with okay, but zero is the resting rate. Explain that a little bit more. So. 
essentially, and I think you hit it on the head when you said this is all artificial. In the, in the sense that it's all government, right. what, what, whether it's quasi private government or just pure government, it's all it's all government is that when, when the banks are loaning to each other because they have these reserve requirements. And also, let, let me add this. I don't know if you guys know this about banking, is that the government controls banks to such a degree they have a requirement that they say, OK, you got to have a certain percentage of mortgages. You have a certain percentage of auto loans and personal loans and reserves and this and that and the other thing. And if they don't meet those requirements by a certain deadline, they get fucking liquidated. So they have like the loan quotas. What? Not, they don't just have loan quotas that they have like percentages. Like you got to have 30 percent of this and 20 percent of that because that's a in quotes good balance, according to the SEC or whoever. Um, and if they don't have it, the government, I can't remember if it's the uh, FCC or the SEC, will come in, nationalize the bank, take it over, and liquidate the assets. So there's there's these interbank markets. This is why your mortgage gets sold 40 times in, th- in 30 minutes. Sure. Is because they go, okay, we need more mortgages, or we need less mortgages, or we need more auto loans, or we need more reserves, or blah, 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 whatever. So in the same rate, because we have this reserve ratio, the reserves are flying around and banks are loaning them to each other. Well, because there's, they're constantly loaning them to each other so much, um, and it's it's kind of, they're not making any money off of it. They're just trying to you know meet regulations. Right. Um, they uh, the 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 price just naturally drops to, um, whatever the interest rates are. Because why would they go underneath the interest rate when they could, when instead of lo- loaning it to another bank, they can just give give it back to the Federal Reserve and get some bonds? Okay. To pay right. out that interest so that's rate. why it's zero is because you can always go back to daddy fed that makes a lot more sense and you can get it for zero yeah well, well, is... yeah, well if, if, if the interest rate is zero if the interest rate is zero now if it's two percent it's never going to go below two percent because i can always go back to the government and right get my 2%. right but that, that's the argument for zero essentially is that if it was set at zero then it can be zero because it's, it's, it's it was, just... yeah, the, yeah the in quotes natural rate would okay. be zero so what happens is that if the rate goes up and the government's actually um, creating more money by paying off bonds, it's actually an inflationary act. Vague. I mean, very slightly. And by decreasing it, it's actually deflationary. And we can see this in Japan, which has had negative interest rates since like the early medieval period. That's a joke. Um, it's been like it's been like 20 years or something. Both of favorite references in Japan. Right. Well, it, but it's it's good accurate. example. Because it's uh, Japan has been on a deflationary spiral for like 20 years. My my uh, wife's Japanese and her parents are trying to sell their house right now. They bought it for a million dollars and they're crossing their fingers trying to get 280, 280,000 right now. Can, can you think can you think about that for a while? Imagine living in a society where if you buy a house, you know, the value is going to just keep going down. Yeah, it's rough. That's not a lot of incentive to buy a house. That's that that's no fun (laughs) right right so okay with all of this the biggest thing that concerns me is that government spending traditionally leads to muted market signals by way of prices right a lot of price manipulation we talked about how a federal job expansion sets an artificial price floor for wages and that's well just like a minimum wage absolutely and and that's that's primarily what i'm against you know, the, there's a lot that's being talked about that I can I can kind of buy into. The parts that I have trouble reconciling is I, I'm I'm real big on. Uh, now, wait, wait, now, hold, no, hold on. When you say when you can buy sure. into, like I said, I'm I'm just like describing the way a rock. No, looks. I, <laughs> I I haven't I haven't really told you what I think we should no, do with totally. the rock. I well, that's that's the thing though too, right? Um, a lot of this stuff, like the the zero bit, I get it. I get it. I, I still think that uh, that naturally there's there's a cost for money. Even but but it, there's no cost when you're the when you're the issuer, right? When you're the issuer, yeah, but not for the government. Right. So then, not for the, the issuer. question. Then the, 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 that that's where this thing is weird. No, no, no. Yeah, go ahead. Let me let me interrupt you. I'm really sorry. So they uh, it's it's a thermodynamic um uh axiom. That you can't create something out of nothing, unless you're the fucking government. 
you can create the money out of nothing. And actually, this is true for everybody. We can all create money out of nothing. I can say, Vinny, right. you have one million Delaners right now. Yep. I'm writing yep. it down in my book. And now you have it. Uh, and that's just a relationship between you and me. What the government does is it comes in and it controls all those relationships. Where they go, no, 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 no. We're the only ones who could do that. Right. Or at least you can only pay your taxes with us doing it. Um, Bob Murphy brought up Macy's cards. You can't pay your taxes with Macy's cards. <laughs> you can tr trade them in for uh, you know stuff at Macy's. J just in the same way, if I give you a million dollars, you might be able to buy the stuff in my house. Right. So it really comes down to acknowledging the violence that the state has a monopoly on. It, well, it it is, and it also comes down to the fact that if we, if you know, let's put our statist hats on for a second, and and you know, I, I know we're like eagerly trying to get to the private currency things but let's just put on our <laughs> status hats sure. for a second um and if we look at the 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 wasted landscape of the economic situation it really sucks for a lot of people right now i know it's been getting a little bit better since since trump got into office but uh it, it still pretty much sucks for a lot of people and when you see that austerity kills the economy and spending boosts it like crazy it becomes a very difficult moral argument to promote austerity and to uh, actually instead of saying spending let me say increased deficit we we discussed there's three different ways to do that um it, be, it becomes a very challenging moral argument to say don't increase the deficit when there when there's very obvious um real benefits at play for the citizenry that uh, and they don't have control over what's going on. They don't have control over the money system. You know, it, it, it's not like, oh, yeah, you're participating in violence by having a bank account. You're just like, motherfucker, I'm trying to get something to eat. <laughs> like, I don't even know what you're talking about. Um, I forgot how we got on this. No, I didn't. I, I, you, you said something that set me I did. off. I did. <laughs> I, well, I was talking about prices. <laughs> prices yes market signals so so market, so signals, market signals so what if i th let me let me um hit that irritation button on you sure what if i said that historically speaking the first creator of prices was the state mm, bit of a chicken and the egg scenario huh no what, what what if i what if i don't say it's chicken or egg what if i just say it's the state well, I'd have a hard time totally buying that because I think that people can absolutely set their own prices on things. Right. Um, I'm saying they can, but they didn't. They didn't. Uh, well, I guess that'd be tough. I'd, that'd be you'd have to. That's one of those things where you'd have to peel back and prove. Right. Yeah. So uh, the book I recommend is Debt, The First 5000 Years by David Graeber. Um, if you can look pa okay. past his obvious left leaningness, it is a, sure. uh, a remarkably well-researched book and uh, he specifically has a chapter called uh the myth of the theory of barter that um goes into what you know th this idea where it's like okay you know once upon a time uh people didn't have money so that they, they had to exchange their goods and services for a certain amount of stuff you know i had shoes and you had dolphins and i wanted two dolphins and you wanted 10 shoes so we exchanged and then someone else is willing to right. pay uh, four shoes for ten dollars, you know, whatever, you know, and and th this is how the basic economy started, and this is cumbersome, and so we invented money, and that it, and and that made everything better. Well, there's no historical evidence of this ever happening, and there's tons of historical evidence where the state came in and started creating money by demanding the tax and uh, spending it into existence, um, going all the way back to uh, ancient Sumer, and uh, Sumer being the the best ancient resource because they seem to have written all their accounting on clay tablets so okay. like the chinese may have done it the incas may have done it but they didn't they didn't write anything down that lasted so we don't know sure i i guess i can okay so for the sake of discussion let's say i accepted that premise that that doesn't change the fact that government intervention still mutes market signals regardless of where that market signal started right like I, I don't know if it's entirely relevant where the price started uh, when you consider 
Right. If you but look at the, I'm saying there wouldn't be a price if the government didn't spend the money into existence in the first place. There would be nothing to price with. Well, well, then then you get back to kind of private currencies, right? Like that that is right. Which which because we've been dealing with currencies from the state for five thousand years, we're able to talk about because we're familiar with this concept of currency. Sure. So uh, I I I know I'm kind of I'm I'm no, being annoying. No, no, no. This is fine. Uh, this is okay. With, and, and this is this is something I battled with as well. And Nima has had to hit me over the head with a hammer on this quite a few times as well. Which is that when we're when we're talking about the the state interfering with prices and interfering with wages and, and you know get, getting in the way of all all this stuff, or um uh in, interfering with the banking system or, or screwing up the interest rates or the spending or or whatever, and uh someone says, okay, we should have a regulation that does this, or we should take away a regulation that does that. And the Austrians come up and say, it's all regulation. It's all bullshit. It's all violence. Let's stop all of it. Um, is that because it's all state, it, it, it's, it's kind of like the military where, you know, if someone writes a new regulation for the military, you don't say, oh, there's more government now. It's just, well, the military is government and regulation is how you tell it what to do. In the same way, the, the monetary system is government and regulation is how you tell it what to do. In a um, sense, I think, um, have you ever read Rothbard's kind of way of looking at it? He he talked about it a bit. I've, I've listened to some of his lectures. Yeah, he talked about it a bit. I like Rothbard. No, he's great. Uh, he talked about it a bit in one of his depression books. He kind of like quantified it as, you know, re regulation that keeps things free shouldn't necessarily be looked at with the same negative connotation that other regulation is. I think it's kind of like it hits on yes. the same premise that you're you're into right now. I completely agree. Well, and, the, and then, I mean, uh, I, I think what I talked about with Dodd-Frank is a perfect example, right? Where it's like, OK, we're going to have this regulation where if you're doing too much of this stuff, we're going to consider you a bank and you got to follow these rules. And, and everyone's like, well, I'll just make more LLCs then. Right. Yeah. There's always that seems like that. Right. Well. I'll, I'll, so I'll I'll just find a way to get around sure. that. Um. Yeah. It's 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 all. I mean, it's it's bullshit, bullshit, bullshit all the way down. And what I'm I think what I'm trying to emphasize is th there's not a point where we're uncovering these layers of bullshit where we we find something underneath. It's all the way down. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I guess. So, I, you know, so when we, we talk about Rothbard a little bit and we talk like one of the things that he talked about a lot is like the kind of the the place people are at right now. They don't they don't mind entirely. People like some of the things that are grant some of the luxuries that are granted by them or granted to them rather by the powers that be that, that, that mm -hmm. some of us are so spiteful toward. Uh, and so, you know, in saying that, I just I just get the sense talking about this kind of stuff that there's a, a, a little bit of a semblance of, well, you know, that's how it's been. So this is how it's got to be for things to keep running smoothly. Do, do you really think that? And, and I don't want I don't want to sound like that. And I can see why it seems like I'm sounding well, like I, that. What I want to go ahead. <clears throat> well, so I want I want to hear what else you had to say at the end of it. If you could answer, uh, do you think that people are capable of disconnecting from this construct. Uh, but first, unpack what you're Absolutely. About to say. Absolutely. Um, and then I, I think I was just about to kind of lead into lead into that. Oh, perfect. Which is, um, and honestly, I think Nima Major deserves the credit for cracking this idea. Uh, he, he wrote an article uh, uh, about it over at beinglibertarian.com. I don't remember the name of the article. You can go, guys, go search it yourself. Oh yeah, uh, I'll pull it but, up. But this, this, and, and, and but, but using MMT to understand Bitcoin, and what I what I'm suggesting this goes back to the beginning of of our conversation is that because we can't expect to take away the system and and revert back to a previous system that you know when we were all, you know, chasing butterflies in in meadows with rainbows and stuff. Uh, <laughs> And, and uh, let, let me let me premise that civilization is an upgrade. Yes. On the human landscape. Things used to be more violent. Right. Right. So this this idea that there was a free currency before is ludicrous. Um, or or, or that currency was more free at some point in the past is it. it well, there was there was you, you can't increase the there was certainly what's that? I, I was going to just to back you up. Actually, I, I agree with you in this aspect. Right. There was no market utopia. 
that exists no. that we don't know about, right? There was no. Yeah, I, we can trade slaves easier in the past. What are you talking about? <laughs> right, right. There's no, there was no <laughs> thriving thing. I, I, you know, I think to be fair, a lot of times that that argument gets brought up to for people to kind of show, you, look, you don't need the state to establish value is kind of the argument they're trying to make. But I do agree with you in that, yep. in that believing that there was some kind of like market utopia that existed in the past, uh, Prior. with or without the yeah. state, is is inaccurate. So. If if we look at the if we look at the premise and we say okay the state's the only thing that's ever created currency or if anyone else ever tried they got smashed by the state because they're jealous of that uh, privilege we'll call it sure um if if we only have the state as the example to uh, analyze money so well then let's analyze how the state has created money the state creates money by creating an imaginary token sometimes they print it on gold and silver um. Sometimes they don't where they uh, demand it in taxes. And the only place that you can get it is from the state or from someone who's licensed by the state, like the private banking system. Um, what this means is that there's an issuer and the issuer has a method of creation and the issuer has a method of destruction of the currency. And this is what they call drives the currency. And I think even thinking about it of like an electrical current, you, like the electrical current has to go from all the way around from the uh, negative to the positive side. And it has to connect or else it doesn't go anywhere. Um, so if we look at Bitcoin, uh, the the issuer is kind of the miners. You, you know, that we that they kind of it's decentralized. So it's a little weird to talk about it in terms of an issuer. Well, but that, in let's a, just say there's this. Um, go ahead. I, I want to hear the rest of it. I, I don't agree, but I, I want to hear you unpack it, it before I, I, I completely say whether I do or do not. Okay, so the the uh, Bitcoin gets issued in quotes by these miners and then um, they're able to spend it or trade it with people. And in order to access the blockchain. And, and generally speaking, the miners are the ones who, who are, faci are facilitating these transactions in order to access the blockchain, you got to pay the miners to in Bitcoin to uh, uh, what, what's the word I want mark down in the ledger that the transaction occurred. So in a very so you're analogous the sense transfer fee, right? The transaction fee, the, yeah, the, the transaction fee that's analogous to taxation. That transfer fee must be paid in Bitcoin. Sure. But how, how is it exactly analogous to, to transact? Like where's the, where's the coercion here? Like, where's the force? It's, no, no, it's no. Just, so, so, yeah. the, so that's what I'm saying. There is no coercion. Um, I, I'm saying, okay, let's look at taxation. And instead of looking at um, the coercion making it valuable, we're going to take that variable out and put an X there. We don't know what's making that valuable anymore. However, we do know that taxation has another component, which it destroys money. So I'm, I'm going to remove the thing that gives it value and keep the thing that says, okay, th there's, there's got to be this aspect that destroys the money. Or takes, takes it out of circulation. So the miners are issuers in the sense that when they mine it, it you know pops out of the, the ether and now it's in a ledger. Um, they can trade it with people and, it, and that gets, in quotes, puts it in circulation. And whenever people want to transact with it, they have to go back to the miner, who generally speaking is, is the one who facilitates the transactions, and pay that miner in Bitcoin. That completes the current. Right, but it doesn't. Or that completes the circuit. It doesn't necessarily like dissolve. It doesn't. It doesn't pop out, right? It goes, it goes right, yeah. back. It gets. Well, yeah. In this, in this case, it doesn't dissolve. And um, I, I would say I think that's uh for me an argument where uh Bitcoin ultimately won't itself be a uh viable currency because there's there's a maximum limit and you're done. There'll be twenty. What is it? Twenty one million or something like that. There'll be twenty one million yeah. and that's the end of it. Right. However, I think some. Uh, <clears throat> I talk fast and I don't give time for uh, interruptions. No, Did you want to interrupt me at that point? No, 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 no. I'm listening, man. <laughs> um, now, when I learned about Steam at Steamit, that's the one that really opened my eyes where I said, wait a minute, this is really analogous to MMT's description of how money works because Steamit 
uh, money money gets created by you interacting on Steam, right? you, you liking stuff or, or writing articles and somebody else liking your stuff or, or whatever. And that creates Steam at coins or tokens or whatever we're calling them, Steam. And you can spend that Steam for media presence. Like, you know, I'll put this up in the rankings or whatever. Um, and that destroys it. That, that takes it out of circulation. So there, there's a real service that gets provided by Steam, which is media presence. And there, there's a method by which the, uh, the Steam is created and a method by which the Steam is destroyed. And what I realized is because, you know, I, I got some cryptocurrencies too, mm-hmm. is uh, Steam was the only cryptocurrency I, w- I was holding on to for reasons other than speculation. Like I wanted it for my to to enhance my media presence. Yeah, it's 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 certainly one of the cryptocurrencies that has established a real good utility for itself. That's absolutely right. So, my opinion, and and we've we've kind of left the realm of 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 you know I'm observing MMT. This is totally my opinion. Uh, okay, now, is that a private currency and let's just assume it's going to be crypto because that seems to be the the uh, most secure way of doing it right it's the best example we have the best example we have um if we want a currency that really is utilized for you know everyday stuff um it the company let's let's just assume that it's a company doing this the company creating it is going to have to do do the services or replace the services, the fundamental ones that the government currently takes care of. I'm talking about, you know, traffic rules or um, real estate title or court system slash arbitration. Or what's another one I'm thinking of? What else does the government do? That's, that's uh, um, policing. OK. In, um, insurance. Like 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 these fundamental base things that um r- really are kind of the glue of our society. If a company is able to use create a currency that can be exchanged for these services, I think we're going to start to see like the real foundation of a real private currency that people are actually using. To facilitate that, all the state has to do is accept them, right? Say that again. In in order I to thought we were play, I thought we were trying to replace the state. Well, uh, okay, fair enough. <laughs> fair enough. In the transition period, though, right? Like they would just have to accept it as you're transitioning to Man, a private currency. Because I, I don't know what they'd have to do. <laughs> we're in fantasy land. I don't know. Right. Well, I don't this know. This is when yeah. it gets tricky. So the only thing I would say is like. I, <laughs> I understand the argument for for the miners is is kind of being uh, like a taxation, but you don't you don't see that as more as paying someone for a service, right? Because there, right there's there's energy involved. There's uh, we've all heard about the energy output that comes. It's from mining. totally paying something somebody for a service in a currency that they created. Sure, right. So, and I think I see where you're getting at whether or not there's coercion. And um, right. Right, because it will, it's because that's just like the fundamental uh, that, construct of taxes. You know what I mean? What? What? It, yes. And however, there's an addition additional fundamental construct of taxes, which is giving money value by destroying it. Right. Or and by destroying, I mean t- taking it out of circulation. Right. That's that's something that the MMT thing here has to offer. So. As far as we have ever known for the past 5,000 years, at least, that money has gotten value through coercion. Now, the the progressive MMTers will jump up and down and say, therefore, it can only be done that way, like they say about fucking everything else <laughs> that the government does. Right. Um, however, if, if we oversee the coercion and we say, OK, what what function does this serve? which is give the money value and take it out of circulation. Well, can we give 
give a private money value and take it out of circulation by offering a valuable service? I think so. Right. But it but it doesn't necessarily remove it from circulation. Actually, it's kind of quite brilliant what it does. Right. Because when 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 there are no more bitcoins to be mined, these fees are what keep miners mining because they get paid to clear blocks. Right. And so right. It, instead of removing it from the available pool of, of, of revenue, and like you said, it is it is finite. But the kind of the catch all for that is it's still being distributed through through the, the, the transaction fee process. Right. And that's why I think Bitcoin is more of a prototype than an actual currency. Sure. OK. OK. What, where it, it, it is analogous, but it doesn't quite get the job done whereas with steam it things are actually being created and destroyed right well they, and, and to that point there's a lot of there's a lot of coins that that burn um so yeah yeah okay this is interesting stuff caitlin we haven't heard from you in a bit do you have any questions yeah you're being really quiet it, it's a lot to take in uh you've kind of answered a lot of my questions as you've gone on um i do have one question though so Going back to like markets and stuff, if free markets don't exist or historically haven't, according to MMT, markets need a state to form. As an observer of MMT and following its premises, do you believe capitalism requires a state to exist? No. How so? I mean, if, if it requires... I think capitalism is a natural force of the universe. I, I completely agree. But I mean, no, according I, to MMT, you have to have a state to have markets and have currency and. Yeah, that, that's that's kind of the progressive side of things. So I'm observing that that's the way it, the order in which it happened okay. in history. Personally, and um, again, I credit Nima with uh, I think he really broke the ice on this one is. Uh, it doesn't have to be that way. And that um. If, if we look at MMT, we can use it to describe and create currency in the future that's private. Okay. And not um, given value by coercion. Agreed. Okay. Okay. Is, is, there, a, is there anything else? I, 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 have, I have a question I'm ready to ask, but I want to make sure you get any that you might have out because you've been so <laughs> quiet here, Caitlin. Do you have anything else you wanted to ask? Is she usually yeah, this I quiet? Sometimes, uh, sometimes. Yeah. it depends on the topic. <laughs> it's it's heavy stuff. Okay. Um, I, it, I've changed my mind on MMT a little bit. Um, the, I, I still am not. I am not a subscriber <laughs> of MMT. But I don't. But, but, it, but it, I have changed my opinion on a couple of things. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't. I don't really have any more questions. This was a really enlightening interview here. So. Yeah, this has been a great podcast, and thank you again for your time, buddy. Um, so yeah, I appreciate you being here. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. This has been a great talk. So, I want to talk about, and, and obviously, I I would assume the people listening have this question at this point too. Let's talk about this demographic that has really taken MMT and ran with it, and in my opinion, they make it very dangerous. And this is that progressive crowd Bernie Sanders. talking about. This is the Bernie Sanders. This Woo-hoo! is the Alexandria Ocasio Cortezes. This is the people that not only believe that MMT is what you say that it is, but they also believe in the things like class warfare. <laughs> uh, how, where are you? With oh, that? How do you feel about man. that? How does that kind of stuff make you feel? As so it supports. I, actually, let, 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 let me say this about these guys. Yeah, I am so happy that they are tearing the Democratic Party a new asshole and causing it to collapse. <laughs> They're really splitting it up from the inside. I, I am so happy that split's happening. Let, let them fight. Let them go at it. Encourage them. Go for it. Yes, you're right. You know, class warfare. The neoliberals are just corporatists. And, oh, my God. They're so awful. Let them do it. I'm happy with that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, um... In terms of, I actually had a private conversation with Warren Mosler, or I should say this is before we hit the record button. Sure. Is that uh, when Warren considers himself a libertarian, by the way. Which is crazy to me. And that he's like, I, I've been, you know, I did some research and he's signing things like pledging that he'll, he'll never, you know, decrease Medicare spending or Social Security spending. It's just very insane to hear those kind of things uh, espoused well, by someone who considers themselves a libertarian. 
Well, and then, you know, with Social Security particularly, I don't like it. I don't think it's a great system. Uh, and it's it, it really puts people in a, in a bad situation, you know, when grandma has to retire on social security after grandpa died and she's eating cat food in a, in a like a little apartment or it's, it's right. stupid. Right. But, um, understanding MMT, I'm at the point where I'm like, okay, just don't fucking touch it. There, there's, there's no reason to kick grandma onto the street by ripping this stuff away. Um, the, the Medicare, I'm not entirely sure how I feel about because I'm, I'm pretty convinced that the reason that it's so fucked up in the first place is because, the government keeps taking everything over. Yeah. Well, that's the which primary um, concern <laughs> of mine when it comes to MMT, because you've got the the, the left that seems to embrace MMT. Yes. Yeah, sorry. The left. It, um, it take over <laughs> everything with the government. Yes. So and, and actually, this is why Nima and I started this. We call it MMT for conservatives is because if we here's the logic up behind it. If we recognize that the description of MMT is accurate and that you can have a political opinion on what to do with it mm -hmm. based off of that being accurate. And if the left essentially monopolizes it, the right's going to be left in the dust, in, in, in quotes right. Um, and not only that, it's going to give a black eye to the theory. It's just going to have a negative connotation with it, with, yes, it, with everyone happening. that has opposing yes. politics. Precisely. Precisely. It's already, it's already so, happening. I. Yeah, and I appreciate you having me on here for that. Sure, sure. Um, sure. But, uh, you know, that, that's fine. I, You know, Nima and I discussed that it's probably better to be more controversial than accurate at this point. <laughs> no, I mean, that's that, but that's that's not a slam. It gets, gets more people paying attention. <laughs> that's that's not a slam uh, to you and any I think what you're, yeah. you know, you're being real fair and real patient here. Uh, I just think that when I see people having discussions about it, right, um, it's just kind of an observation that, for the most part, that narrative is already kind of set. Is it like a MMT is a leftist yeah. thing and that's a negative connotation? Sure. Well, we'll. Uh, I got a really big sledgehammer. We'll bust that fucker open. I have no problem doing yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, at, at, um, at the end here, I'm going to make sure... <laughs> uh, at the end, I'm going to make sure... I know you got your own channel. I'm going to make sure we give you a chance to plug that so everyone can go and, sure. and check it out. There. So anyway, getting back to this private conversation with Warren Mosler. Yes. So particularly with the federal job guarantee that these guys are jumping up and down about, he says the progressives have completely missed the point. And he says it actually should be referred to the federal transition job because the progressives seem to think of it as a way to permanently employ everybody. And Warren Moser says, no, 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 no. This is simply a way to get people into the private sector because there's an issue in economics where employers don't want to hire people who are unemployed for various reasons. Sure. You know, I, I mean, as an employer, just think about it. It's like, why don't you have a job? What's wrong with right? You? Why is your work history non-existent? Why is your work history non-existent? So the, the idea is to essentially to there, there's two things with the federal job guarantee. I, I, yeah. Even I'm doing it. The federal transition job. Sure. There we go. <laughs> uh, it's easier to say federal job guarantee, which is unfortunate. It is. It's like the printing uh, money thing. Yes. So is that by if money has to be created by the government, it's like, well, OK, well, I guess we got to create it that way. Um is if we, particularly if, if this gets localized, for example, if each municipality can get access to this money creation through the tr federal transition job and say, okay, well, well, we'll find something for you guys to do. We'll improve something. What that's going to do is instead of costing the community money, it's going to create money for the community. And that, and that money is going to be spent into the private sector. And then, like I said, uh, at the beginning, for example, with the restaurant, once more people are getting it, going into that restaurant, the restaurant is going to start hiring more people because the, the capacity is being reached. And the goal is for the private sector to hire out all these people on the federal transition job, because that's the natural balance to say, OK, there is now enough money in the system for everybody to work. Stop creating the money. What would be the incentive for and, those workers to go to the private sector where, you know, Employment is the private sector will pay them more. Yes, but employment isn't guaranteed like it would be in the public sector. Right. Well, yeah, that's the whole idea about um, killing so, motivation. Say that again. 
Well, just the, yeah, just, just, run, just run that by me again. You can head, Caitlin. Yeah, so, like, what would be, uh, I guess, the incentive for people to get off of the public jobs program where... More money. Yes, but they, their employment isn't guaranteed like it is in the public sector. You know, in the when they're doing this jobs program, they're guaranteed this job. But you go to a private company and you might have a job this week, but you might not next week. You, you know what I mean? So, um, for, first of all, and then this is probably, again, where uh, we disagree with the lefties, is... This is a job where you got to show up on time. You got to work a certain number of hours and you can get fired. Okay. Okay. You you, you got to actually do the work. You, you know, you, you got to have a certain hygiene standard, uh, you know, all, all this stuff. Uh, it, the, you know, it can't be something where, you know, the WPA where you lean on your shovel all day. Now, I understand the inherent issue, which is um, n- naturally government programs are going to do that. That, that's yeah. just what they do. I mean, and, you, you, um, you look at road crews I now think partially, all of these government employees that have, you know... Oh, my God. Uh, my, my, my cousin builds roads. You should hear him <laughs> go off at him. <laughs> my, my, my uncle and his, his son, they have a private trucking company, and they literally build roads. And they're like, what the, took those guys three weeks I could have done yeah. in two days? Well, that's that's the thing, though. Um, Sorry, with, rant. You know, public jobs, the job performance standards are obviously not up to the private sector's standards. So I, I feel like... Correct. And then this is another thing that Warren says... ...be enough to get into the private sector. Well, so this is what Warren says, which is that, first and foremost, that this federal transition job cannot compete with the private sector. Like... Like we're talking about whatever the, it's this pe- the uh, the wages for this that sets the floor for the minimum wage if it's above the minimum wage. So for so what Warren suggests is that let's say if the minimum wage is already ten, you get paid nine dollars an hour at the fe- federal transition job. Now, if Caitlin, I, I would argue this: if someone is so retarded. <laughs> <laughs> that they can't transition themselves from the federal transition job to the private sector. They probably didn't make it to the federal transition job right, in the first fair. place. Uh, <laughs> so to your, and <laughs> to defend a little bit too the, the position that you're coming from, I think if we, if we actually look at the data, uh, these, these low skilled, low wage jobs aren't really much more uh, than, than a, a passing phase for most people. Uh, that are employed Correct. in them. I think this, I, you know, this is tough when we start getting into hard numbers, but I think we're looking at numbers somewhere around like 2% of the individuals that, you know, in a two year span are still going to be in those jobs. Right. And so that's when you, when Precisely. you consider that, um, I think the data actually does kind of lay on the side of um, the fact that it's it's been proven that these things do get transitioned out of rather quickly for most individuals, uh, short of that two percent that that don't seem to yeah. move around. And, and if that two percent can't move, let them keep fucking cleaning the streets. I don't care. I make nine dollars an hour, or whatever. I would agree <laughs> that that we we definitely shouldn't be. Uh, you know, the sky doesn't fall for two percent. Yeah. Well, and, and then th- this this is another thing. Nima's got this on his Facebook. Uh, page which is uh, economics junkie where his uh, profile picture is the uh, the government spending and it's like you know this massive chunk social security that, and uh, this massive chunk welfare and medicare this slightly less massive chunk military and this tiny sliver that's like less than 10 percent, which is everything else and when 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 the government's ever battling, you know, the Democrats and the Republicans are ever at each other's throats about the the government spending. They're only ever talking about that tiny little sliver. Well, I I, I think the, the the Republicans try to talk about the Social Security bit, but when that they're one, not that in one power, seems real hard to budge when they're not in power. Yeah. Well, regardless, that's a tough one to move. Like no matter how much you hate it, that that seems to be a tough one to move. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, and then I mean, so what's the best way to go about privatizing these kinds of these social programs like Social Security, um, Medicare, Medicaid, all of this stuff? What's I mean, if 
if we're going by MMT standards, how do you move that? To oh, you destroy standard? the public educational system. Yeah, I like what I'm hearing. There you go. <laughs> I mean, now you're speaking my language. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how to answer any of this until we start there. I'm, I mean, it's like I love it. If if we if we keep creating zombie robots as fast as we can pump them out of the factory, fuck whatever we're talking about. Yeah, I mean, it just doesn't you're not matter. Wrong. I, I mean, look at Mark Dice interviewing people in California all day, every day. Yeah, like. So do you do you prefer a private currency or a government one? Huh? <laughs> well, you got, yeah. the whole incentive structure is really out of whack. People have to be, and it's just yeah. like you said, people have to be reprogrammed. That's exactly it. And when you talk about programming, whether or not anyone likes that term or likes to hear it, all of this is absolutely done at that whole half of your life <laughs> in the beginning yeah, that you exactly. indoctrinated into education systems that essentially program you. Well, and, you know, one of the things I've been learning and uh, the, I, I don't know you, you guys, have you guys started your own businesses? Yeah. Yeah. Somewhat. <laughs> um, have you ever, have you ever gone after financing? Yes. Not for a business. Like how much? Not, not a ton. Not, no, we're not talking franchise money. Okay. Cause, uh. I'm I'm finishing up flipping my first house, mm -hmm. which actually ended up being a land development. We ended up tearing the fucker down. Um, what what I'm starting to realize is the power in relationships. Where we've all been taught from the, and I think this mostly comes from the leftist public educational fucking system, where you know you're the working class and you make money by swinging a hammer, and that's you. Where it's like, uh, well, I want to flip a house and make a bunch of money. And someone says, well, you don't have any money. I'm like, well, yeah, he does. I'll use his. <laughs> and uh, I, I raised a quarter million dollars of private funds just by asking people for money. And it's like, suddenly I can do this thing. And I'm like, oh, and I'm thinking, wow, well, what else can I do? And my my understanding of my own power based off of um, how how money works and, and regardless of whether the, the government creates it or not is that I can do some really big stuff now simply by adjusting my relationships. And it's not like this, this linear idea where I, it's like, okay, I got, I got to work and save up $250,000 in order to do this project. I just got to find somebody else who did that. <laughs> right. Um, and the public educational system just smacks that out of you. Like, don't talk to anybody. You're not allowed to work with anybody else. You know, uh, this test is all you. And it's standardized test, standardized testing. Um, memorize all this bullshit math where you solve for X and never figure out what to do with it and get scared if somebody mentions the word word problems. And for, for example, tell me when you want me to stop ranting. I'll, I'll just no. I going. Look, I appreciate it. I've been, <laughs> I've been trying to go down this rabbit hole to learn as much as I could, because when I talk about something, yeah. I want to make sure I understand it. So this is good. I appreciate this. Go ahead. I, I talked about hacking mortgages, right? Yeah. Did you know, and this depends on everybody's personal situation, you could turn a 30 year mortgage into about eight years and cut off like 80% of the interest out of it without earning any more money. How do you do that? Well, it's it. I can't tell you in ten seconds. <laughs> sure. this, this, this would be another. I actually made a video on my channel called "Mortgages Are Bullshit," where I I tell about half the story. But nice. um, it it has to do with the the nature of amortized interest versus simple interest, and the way that we use financial instruments, and the way we've been taught to use financial instruments is like. What is the maximum rate I can shoot myself in the dick sort of strategy? <laughs> it, 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 it's like this Feels clip like isn't big enough. Right. <laughs> this clip isn't big enough. How do I get the bigger clip to shoot myself in the dick more? That's how we've been taught to use financial instruments. Yes. Um, and the, the rich people don't do this. And it's once you figure out how to do it, it's so bizarre because it's like the tools were at your feet the whole time. You just didn't know how to use them. And it's, it's something is similar to like what I said about, you know, asking somebody for money to do this project where I'm like, OK, I just asked for a quarter million dollars. Well, what's to stop me from asking for a quarter billion? Like, can you do that? A credit score, probably. No, no, no. 
do you have a quarter billion dollars? Can I have it? Oh, okay. I gotcha. Sure. Right. Um, but like mo- and, most people don't have a quarter billion dollars. <laughs> no, but I mean, so in fact, it, I've been watching Dan Pena. I don't know if you guys know who that is. No, he's he's uh, he, he has a company. I think it's called a Quantum Leap uh, Advantage, where he essentially takes people and turns them into, a, you know, multimillion dollar businessmen. OK, where essentially you set up your relationships and you borrow somebody else's uh, experience, you borrow somebody else's money, and you, you know, purchase a business at discount. And, and when I say purchase a business, I'm talking like, you know, 50, $500 million business. Mm-hmm. And it was simply figuring out who you needed to talk to and how to put the team together. Hmm. This is what I'm talking about is literally the opposite of how we learned in school. Right. Like, like literally yeah, the opposite. You're, you're taught to rely on yourself. Yeah. You're taught to rely on yourself and that you don't deserve anything and that you have to pay the debt that was given to you. Shake my finger at you rah, in the way that you were told. Uh, and the world totally doesn't work like that. Hmm. And so, I, I mean, I, I know we, we kind of got distracted from the MMT thing. What I'm saying is if we're, if we're going to talk about, uh, Something like, okay, how do we replace Medicare? How do we replace Social Security with the private sector? I think there's a problem that has to be solved first, which is people's understanding of what they're able to do in the current system. That's fair. How do you feel about situations? But before we reinvent the system, Mm -hmm. realize that um, it it is very, very fair if you know the rules and the public educational system won't teach them to you. I agree with that. I do agree with that. But I, uh, so I also wonder about things like there's, uh, you know, I forget the state that it was in, but there was a hospital that did something so simple as just showing their prices. Oklahoma. Yeah, this is the one Stefan Molyneux got his, uh, his uh, can- tumor removed from. Oh, I, I, I don't know about all that. Uh, I just, so I guess Oklahoma okay. or something, but I'm, I'm, ta- I'm, yeah, yeah. I think it's, we're talking about the same one. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm more referring to just this kind of this, what, what ended up happening, right? They ended up showing their prices uh-huh. as such. They got, they got more, more people came right. And, and they got more business when this happened, the other hospitals took notice and they showed their prices too. And then now that you have two hospitals that are both showing their prices now, now there's, there's competition in prices. And this is kind of what mm-hmm. we talk about when we refer to natural market signals. Uh, and this is, you know, I'll harken back to the beginning of, of this course. conversation. We started, yeah, you know, like it, it, it not really consequential at this point who started the price, but more so that the market is open and that uh, a natural price is allowed to settle here. Uh, one that isn't manipulated by because, you know, like what what industry works in that way? Right. You don't go to the grocery store and then you, you grab everything you need. You put it in your cart, you put it in the bag and you leave. And then two weeks later, you get a bill for how much everything costs. Right? It's it's completely absurd. Right, and you cross your fingers, your insurance company will take care of it. Right, right, exactly. Like it's just <laughs> totally absurd how that it's, works. It's, it's absolutely absurd. I agree. Yeah, and so I think that the, the, that that plays a large part too, right? Uh, and I, while I do agree with you completely, in that the education core has to change, I a hundred percent in agreement there. I don't I don't know if it's necessarily the only thing when we talk about what can be done, because a situation like that, like a situation with medical, when you if you just removed a couple key players there from all the privilege that they have, uh, specifically IP and, and in the pharmaceutical industry and and this this kind of shielding of prices, I think that that makes a big difference, you know, and if you can do something, I, I agree with you completely. Yeah. And like if you could do something that lowers prices so much to a point where paying for medical insurance isn't a lot different than the prices in paying for good dental insurance, that in and of itself, not only kind of fixes it without you having to, to, to trick too much with the minds, you know, of society, but it, it also sets an example for industry, right? And and it sets a model. Do you think that that is, is, is just as viable an approach at kind of getting out from under some of this stuff. Absolutely. Ahead. Well, and then uh, I think the way that gets done is by the strength of individual action. Okay. You know, s- s- someone needs to say, like like this guy down in this doctor or a hospital, wherever it is down in Oklahoma, says, you know what? I'm tired of this fucking shit. And I know how to, f- I know how to make a very big impact. 
Right. I'm going to start showing my prices and show everybody how much cheaper I am. See, it has a huge impact. And um, I, I, and, and I, I mean, I, I was half joking when I threw that thing out about the, the public educational system, because obviously <laughs> there's, there's other ways to get at it. Sure. But if we um, decrease the number of zombies being produced, we will increase the chance that these stellar individuals will jump up and say, aha, I have a solution to something. Absolutely. Well, that's where it comes from. I mean, you have yeah, to have I, these solutions I, available, at least for examples, to show people that you don't need the government to provide these services, that there is another way to do it. So, yeah, definitely. So, yeah, well, and then... Actually, no, I'm that I'm going to be talking about healthcare, and we're supposed to be talking about MMT. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> this is no <laughs> good. I think this is good. This is a good conversation to have because when you talk about MMT, we already talked about the demographic that really holds on to it. And what is the topic that that demographic can't let go of? And it's it's medical. It's it's healthcare, right? And we're in this this conversation now as people of this country that is a passionate conversation where people are just coming at it from almost the same kind of emotional level that they come at the gun conversation where they they don't want to talk about it anymore. They're, they're ready to say, look, yeah. it's, it's working in Denmark. It's working in England. It's working in Canada. We're the only place that doesn't do it. There's no reason I'm not going to listen anymore. We need it for everybody. Right. That's, that's tough. I got to say what, when I lived in Austria and I had a, uh, a social insurance card, it was pretty sweet for me to just walk around swiping it. <laughs> I'll take a little bit of that and I'll take a little bit of that, please, and give me some of that. I'm like, yeah, clean my teeth. Yeah, give me, you know, some massage or whatever. Uh, but there's, like we're talking about, there's there's ramifications to it. And um, I, I'm not entirely sure where I stand at the moment, particularly in the short term, because uh Particularly with the uh, the affordable Affordable Care Act, ha 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 ha. <laughs> uh, That's a good name. For it's it, it's huh? like the the absolute worst of all worlds, where it's like, okay, we're gonna put oh, yeah. the government in complete control to give all the money to these uh, corporations that are making health insurance that are making companies. the prices higher. Yeah, and and it's like, well, what? <laughs> so, in lieu of that, I you know. I, now that I understand MMT, it's like, okay, for now, just fucking pay for it while we figure it out. Now, being an ANCAP, I know the danger of me saying that, which is if they do that, you may never get out of it. Yeah, well, and like you get into these weird ethical things that, that pop up like this Alfie Evans story. I don't know if you're familiar with that. No, which one was that? That's the kid that um, he was in UK and he. Oh, he couldn't come here. No, that was the one before him. Um, that was, that was a Charlie Guard. <laughs> Let's situation. pull out the list. Right, right. Yeah. No, that was a Charlie Guard situation. Uh, but this was this was similar. It was a child that had been in the hospital. Um, they he had a, a rare condition. Um, had him in you know pretty bad shape. He had to be on life support. He was I think in the hospital for over a year. Caitlin, yes. Do you remember? Yeah, it was over a year. He was, uh, yeah, he was in there for a long time. He wasn't time. in good shape, but um, they had doctors in uh, Italy who were going to um, continue his care. It's sound, sounding yeah. more familiar. Yeah, yeah. They, they were, so the doctors in Italy were basically, you know, I don't, I, to be fair, I don't think anyone in this situation said, hey, we, we can fix him. Right. I, I think just the doctors and but we can try. Yeah, right. Like, we'll we'll have him here. And even if it's just to keep him on life support longer. So we don't have to deal with what happens if the the you know plug gets pulled. We'll do that. And they mm -hmm. were pretty much you know the state said no, you can't. So the the state for one said we're going to pull the plug, and for two they said and you can't take him anywhere either. And they even got to a point where they said and you can't go home. So you can't take him home. So basically we're going to pull the plug and he's going to die here, and that's what you're going to do. And yeah. this is in the UK. Yeah. Yeah, those guys. Yeah, but what I mean, about them? <laughs> you know, this is <clears throat> this is a natural byproduct so, of having those things embedded is. together, though, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. And and you know, when I uh, have you, you guys know who Carol Quigley was, right? Nope. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm not familiar. Tra tra tragedy and hope. Boy, I feel like a big dummy. Come on, still. No, no, I got come it. on. 
the, you know, uh, it was Bill Clinton's mentor, the guy he, he talked about in his inauguration speech. Oh, good old one that man. all the conspiracy theorists go to and they're like, look, he wrote it in a book. Oh, boy. No. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, he wrote this book called Tragedy and Hope. It's it's like this 1350 page tome. It's awesome. Holy shit. The guy is such a brilliant, brilliant writer. I have to check uh, it out. I totally recommend it. But uh, yeah, he, he had some funny thing to say about the uh, in it, this is written in the 60s about uh, the way that the government has taken over the uh, healthcare system where because the the situation is set up where you have to pass these tests in order to get the license to become a doctor um it's you don't become a doctor by wanting to help people now you become a doctor by dealing with this bureaucratic bullshit so instead of attracting people who really want to help people now you're attracting people who they they want the money or they want the fame or or they they want the whatever and and they're and they're willing to deal with the drama of bureaucracy well you've you've just created this armada of health in quotes healthcare professionals that don't give a shit about you yeah right and um i hate going to the doctor i i I could probably count on my on one hand the times I've gone to the doctor and they've actually done something useful for me. Um, almost always I got to do my own research and figure out what's going on. Yeah, outside of anything super and, critical that you see, you well, see and then um, unless something's getting sewn back. Yeah, yeah, with them. yeah. yeah if, if my arm's broken or I'm in a car wreck, fine. Sure. I had a heart attack, whatever. Sure. But oh, and actually not even not even the heart attack because you're eating too much wheat if you had the heart attack. Right. But when you wake up um, and you're not feeling good, you don't go to the doctor. Um, no, I, I, I do my own research. Right. Or, or I say, OK, well, you know, what was I drinking last night or, you know, whatever. Um, have you guys heard of Beyond Wellness Radio? No. This is you're showing me all kinds of new dude, stuff. Today. I like this, dude. It's it's two functional doctors, functional medicine doctors, and and they just get on and they talk about a topic. Uh, they are mind blowing because uh, they're, they're actual doctors. They have actual patients, and they're actually doing the stuff that they're talking about. And when uh, they said that ninety percent of the of the stuff that people bring to them is solved with. Uh, a combination of three things gut thyroid adrenals huh and they, they say first thing they go for is the gut because i'm sure you guys have done research yes. on how you know important the biome in the gut is yeah and um then they go to the thyroid and then they go to the adrenals because that's where the home hormones are and they said nor normally by the time we get to that part whatever the problem the person had is fixed rarely does something go beyond that and so we have this entire healthcare system that's just freaking out about people sick for fucking everything. And it's all like, oh, yeah, you're you had a parasite huh. or you're, you're eating too much of this. Or it's like, oh, yeah, you um, th this your, your T3 is getting blocked. So we, we, we got to do this and your your thyroid will start working again, and then you're fine. And so th this this like, oh, we need all this money for all this health care. Yeah, there's some people who are really sick and can really use it. But like 90 percent of the population doesn't need it. They just need. Better nutrition and some gut health and hormone adjustment. Right. Well, you know, this kind of goes hand in hand with what we were talking about before with the. It goes exa exactly exactly hand in hand because. The, the, <laughs> yeah, well, with with the way that this. The, the system set up, it's attracted all this bullshit and the government gets to decide what's healthy and not, not because if it's healthy or not, but because by dictate. Right. Right. And, and on top of that, it's like we talked about uh, before with the, with the, the, the 2% problem is when you try to have conversations about this stuff, the fact that there are things that need to be paid for in the medical industry, right? The fact that there is actually stuff that does cost money. But like what you're yeah. saying is also absolutely true is that's not the majority, right? That's not, that's not the yeah. majority of care. The majority of care is not this super custom, super expensive, crazy care. Th those, those are use cases that exist. Those are scenarios that, that are real, but that's not the average. And with a government run system, you know, you're, you're not incentivizing no. for that's a great people point. to, I guess, downsize their, 
their care. You know what I mean? Like it, it incentivizes more bloated um, health agencies. So the costs more specialists, and they're not going to zone in on these problems because it's yeah. it's not cost. Yeah. Beneficial. So you know, you want to send people to five different specialists. You don't just want to address the problem right off the bat. Of course. Well, it's it's like my HUD contract I talked about in the at the beginning of the show. Is exactly. as soon as I yeah. found out it was HUD, I'm like, oh, add the zeros. Ah. Right. <laughs> right. There's so there's so a yeah, problem. Yeah, it, 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 well, it's complicated, and I don't necessarily know what to do about it. Yeah, yeah, it's tough. Um, I, I mean, the, the only thing I I could solidly fall back on, like I said, this is this is short and medium term, term which is don't balance the budget and don't have a federal government surplus because it'll crash the economy. Um, there, there's better and worse ways to do that spending, but or or you know tax reduction, but don't kill everybody just because you think it's a good idea to bring on you know libertarian utopia yeah no that i mean certainly given us a lot to think about we've we've got a bit long this is this is longer than we usually go but it's totally worth it, it can we have you on again soon i'd like to continue this conversation have me on yeah. whenever you want You've awesome been a fantastic guest <laughs> awesome i'm sure thank you you know we have we have people that listen to this and we talk to them i'd like to have people listen to this and digest it and maybe um on the next episode, we can field some questions from them and see if anyone has any, sure. any questions. on. And what then um, particularly on MMT, I really recommend getting Nima on. Uh, I, th I think I'm a little more animated than he is, but I think he knows MMT better than I do. Sure. Maybe we can have you guys so, both um, on you next might, time. Yeah. Um, if you hit him with the same questions, he might give you different or better answers. <laughs> sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Um, and you, you have a channel. I'd like you to talk about that and plug that. Where can people go if they'd like to check this out and, and uh, hear some more from you? Yes. So right now I'm, I'm still in the beginning stages and you know, I shouldn't shoot myself in the foot like this, but, um, made a YouTube channel, the volitional science network. Uh, it wasn't supposed to be focused on economics, but I seem to be maybe making more economics videos with Nima than anything else. The, uh, Hey, I found him the <laughs> right the the actually the major premise of my intention of of making the show was to talk about intellectual self defense and how to spot bullshitters in your life and how to deal with them i like it so i've made a few videos on that i'm planning on making more but yeah it's it's definitely mostly economic videos at this point that sounds like a good mix i can get into that yeah yeah I want to have that mortgages are bullshit video. Go I am check definitely that one out. I think everybody that out like that for sure. Yeah, I'm gonna get into that. Maybe you I can, a, maybe we can talk you, you into writing. You have a mortgage. Game. I had a mortgage. Um, I'm renting now, but I I had a considerable mortgage at one point. It would have been good to it. I, I have a mortgage, and I'm very interested. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we can chat. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay, cool. Well. Man, uh, thanks again for coming on. Um, I I really thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Hopefully, the listeners will too. Is there anything that anyone would like to say before we get out of here? Uh, no. No. Thanks for having me on again. Thanks, yeah, absolutely. Thanks for, thanks for thanks again for having me on. There we go. There. <laughs> absolutely. All right. Well, <laughs> on behalf of everybody here, uh, thank you guys for listening. And whether or not you like it, we'll probably be back again. 